This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support is provided by the Annenberg Foundation and the Friends of Firing Line. Uh, the question before the House <clears throat> has to do with the use of language. Uh, there is no formal way in which uh, speech can be regulated, but uh, speech is nevertheless uh, routinely uh, regulated in carefully edited books, journals, and newspapers. If you write the New York Times, quote, give Al Gore and I a chance, uh, the editor will correct the solecism unless it is immune because those were words actually uttered by the President of the United States. Our guest today is Professor Steven Pinker, a latitudinarian in language, whose book, The Language Instinct, How the Mind Creates Language, uh, was published last year to some acclaim. Mr. Pinker uh, appears to have no quarrel with language, however it is uh, extruded. Uh, some years ago, I wrote an introduction to an edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, and begging your leave, I quote myself, I wrote that, quote, precision is still possible precisely because mere usage, however prolonged, does not baptize. Uh, providence in due course sometimes accepts into its bosom sinners, but usually only after time served in the antechambers. <coughs> well, off we go. Professor Pinker was born in Canada, is a graduate of McGill with a doctorate from Harvard in psychology, and is now head of the Cognitive Neuroscience Department at MIT. I begin by asking Dr. Pinker whether he objects to the habit of some dictionaries to in designating particular words to say slang or even uh, illiterate? Oh, no, I have no objection. Uh, I think a, a good writer wants to know how uh, words will be received, how people are currently using them, and that's one of the crucial bits of information about a word that you want to know. Well, but uh, uh, don't they, in making those assertions, uh, assume an authority which you, your book denies them? No, I think we should just be clear what we mean by uh, uh, proper language. I think there are differences in dialects. I think that uh, rural Americans speak a slightly different dialect than uh, urban Americans. There are forms of uh, English that uh, urban black people speak that are simply different dialects. I don't think that um, any old dialect should be used in newspapers or journalism or science. I think there should be uh, standardized forms, just like there are standards for what side of the road you drive on. It's uh, good to have a degree of consistency uh, in certain forms. Everyone should use the same form of speech. Uh, I'm simply objecting to calling, say, black English um, bad grammar or fractured syntax. It's simply uh, the syntax of a different dialect. And just as there's um, nothing wrong with inherently with driving on the left or driving on the right, as long as everyone does it on the same side in the same country, uh, there's nothing wrong with other dialects of English, but in certain arenas, we want to uh, establish a standard and we all want to use the same form. So that's really the distinction I'm making. I don't think that people should write however they please, wherever they please. I think we should just be clearer as to what we're saying when we uh, insist on certain standards. Well, but to, to what extent uh, is there an aesthetic dimension, uh, and to what extent is it the responsibility, uh, so to speak, guardians of the language uh, to look over. You, you quote um, with great satisfaction uh, John, Dr. Johnson who um, says, look, you can't do it because uh, the words get away from you. And the Harvard professor who wrote the other half of the introduction of that particular dictionary makes, makes that point. What he says is, look, words are going to acquire their own meaning if, and there is no law save usage under the circumstances, it becomes silly to attempt to arrest the natural evolution of a word. I didn't find you disagreeing with that. No, that's right. I think uh, there's some distinctions that I personally would like to keep. I like disinterested, meaning impartial, as opposed to bored. I like parameter, meaning dimension of variation, as opposed to perimeter or yeah. limit. 
But on the other hand, taking the long view, I realize there's not a whole lot that I'm going to be able to do about it. Uh, language is always changing. Uh, we, you and I aren't talking now the way people spoke 200 years ago or 300 years ago. <coughs> Uh, at any point in time, people looking at this change see it as a deterioration. In the 17th century, they were saying that English had deteriorated so much and things were getting so bad that people would be just grunting and squeaking in 100 years. And in the 18th century, people said that language would deteriorate by the 19th century and so on. Uh, there has never been any language in any period in history that has not changed. And so we should, uh, you know, while, while striving for the clearest and most aesthetically pleasing language, realize at the same time that it is going to change and there is nothing we can do about it. Well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see why you sound so, so helpless on, on, on the question because one of the things you can do about it is instruct your students uh, not to uh, abuse uh, the language, right? I mean, my, my father would have dropped dead if you had said, uh, give it to Al Gore and I. I mean, I think he, I think he would have come to think of it. I think he would have dropped dead. Uh, 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 now, this was in part, and this is, this is not uninteresting, because he spent <clears throat> a lot of time uh, in his life, uh, 30, 40 years of his life, in, in, in Mexico. And uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, they don't make grammatical mistakes in Spanish. It's inconceivable that you would get the objective pronoun mixed up with the subjective pronoun. Uh, now, therefore, that sort of closes in and becomes an aesthetic sensibility, which you tend to fight to maintain. Now, when Webster's Three came out, what was it, 50, 59, they stopped classifying words as um, slang, vulgar, illiterate, and uh, they were given a wonderfully resonant tongue lashing by Dwight MacDonald in the, in the New Yorker, who said precisely the point of a dictionary is to try to maintain standards. Now, this doesn't mean that you can say, we refuse to recognize the use of the word parameter when what you really mean is perimeter. Uh, eventually, you have to give up on these, on these matters, like hopefully. But it does attempt to prolong uh, the establishment of correct usage, doesn't it? Well, think about what dictionaries do when you say that they're there to preserve standards. But where do these standards come from? It's not as if we have a tribunal or a legislature that decides what's going to be proper English. In fact, if you go visit the headquarters of a, a, a dictionary publisher, what they do is they collect lots and lots of slips of paper on how people use words. So in a way, the uh, dictionaries and the um, people who try to speak properly are taking in each other's laundry. There's not uh, Well, that's not 100 percent true. Now, the Heritage Dictionary, for instance, uh, uh, I've been on their panel for 30 years, and a lot of other people have. And about twice a year, you get um, six pages of things. Do you approve or disapprove greatly, ungreatly, of the following? And you click, 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 click. And then when they, when they reproduce that word, they tell you how their usage panel reacts. For instance, hopefully, meaning we hope so. Uh, was much more approved 20 years ago than now, because now people have reacted to the misuse of it as a sort of one step too many. I'm just quoting the American Heritage mm -hmm. Dictionary. Now, uh, uh, in, in that sense, wouldn't you say that they are attempting to collect enlightened aesthetic views on the use of language where there's ambiguity? They are, and in fact, I, I, the American Heritage Dictionary is a, a wonderful dictionary precisely because it takes such an enlightened view towards usage. In fact, they give excellent reasons why, hopefully, in the supposedly incorrect sense... They of, defend it. They defend they it defend with it, yeah. excellent reasons. They say that it, it improves precision because there are things that you can say using hopefully, as in hopefully the treaty will pass, that you can't say if you were to follow the guidelines of the purists. The purists would have you say something like, it is to be hoped that the treaty will pass. Or one which hopes. Is, or one, one hopes, hopes yeah. or I hope that the treaty will pass. None of which mean the same thing. I mean, I don't want to say I hope the treaty will, will pass because who cares what I think? If I'm saying hopefully, I mean to express the opinion that it is In to the be best hoped of all by everyone. World, it exactly. Pass, yeah, yeah. It is to be hoped that the treaty will pass has all of the sins of bad writing. It's wordy. It uses the passive voice. It's vague. Hopefully the treaty will pass is much more precise and much more aesthetically pleasing. And I think that's why, that's probably my quarrel with a lot of the, uh, the language purists. It's not that I uh, don't believe that language should be clear and precise and aesthetically pleasing. It's just that a lot of the traditional rules get in the way of that 
To give you an example, the, one of my favorite bits of prose is the opening of Star Trek. It's five-year mission to boldly go where no man has gone before, a split infinitive. Not to go boldly. Yeah. Now, to go boldly, mm -hmm. I mean, for, that, that sounds awful. It ruins the uh, iambic meter. Yeah. It doesn't improve clarity or precision. And in fact, there's no reason for the split infinitive rule to begin with. It's an old wives' tale that goes back to days when English was, grammars were supposed to be based on Latin language, of, supposedly of precision and, uh, and, and perfection. Well, <coughs> um, what, is, what is the, the great lexicographer, the, um, oh goodness. A anyway, he, he wrote in the 1920s on the split infinitive, the world is divided between A, those who know, B, those who don't know, those who care, those who don't care, those who know and care. <laughs> and then he gave ins instances of the split infinitive which were perfectly okay instances in which they really should have been uh, avoided. Uh, that, that kind of effort, I think, is, 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 is justified. Granted, what he, what he wrote uh, then is not always appropriate now, given these, these, uh, uh, this, this evolution. But uh, who was it? Uh, the, the English language is a wonderfully versatile instrument, but there are certain things you can't do with it. And uh, right now, there isn't a word that expresses hopefully, uh, in the sense in which you use it, except hopefully. Someone suggested draws. hopably. What's that? Someone suggested hopably. Hopably. It's not caught on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, the, the, your, your um, how, how would we say that you're in your book, with whom is your quarrel? Um, it's with um, people who say that uh, Speakers of non-standard versions of English are uh, speaking ungrammatically or are ignorant of language. Uh, say people who say that Black English is an ignorant form of speech. I'd have a quarrel with them. Uh, it's with now, what is your quarrel with them? Oh, that this, that that uh, Black English is a dialect. Uh, that it's. I don't think we should. Uh, I don't think students should hand term papers in in Black English, but I don't think they should hand term papers in in Dutch either. It's not the language of higher education. But that is very different from saying that they're ignorant of how language works, which is what people like uh, John Simon uh, have said in print. So I'd have a quarrel with that. I have a quarrel well, with... Well, they're, they're ignorant of how other Americans uh, uh, express their language, right? Well, they, in the same sense that uh, I'm ignorant so I, of how I'd be Dutch late works. Today. Uh, is is to express things differently from how you would express yeah. it, uh, and therefore they are either disdainful of your use or ignorant of it. Well, in the same sense that I'm ignorant of Dutch. I mean, it's yeah, a, it's yeah. a tendentious Ignore, way of putting yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that I don't speak Dutch, and I would say that that students who perhaps use Black English uh, don't speak standard English, and it's a good thing if they uh, were to learn standard English as a second language. It's it's uh, essential that they do. But it's very different from saying that they're ignorant of how language works. So I'd have quarrel with that. You, you mean uh, it's the derogatory character of the word ignorant that offends you? Yes. Uh, so and, we and need inaccurate. another word for it. Well, I and, and inaccurate. I mean, it's ignorant generally implies that you've had the opportunity to learn it, but have just not received the news or unaware of what yeah, you don't know. That's, yeah, that is uh, a use of ignorant. Mm -hmm. If you say, as you say, I ignore Dutch, it means I don't know Dutch, but it's not used that way anymore. It means I don't know Dutch. Yeah. And your other quarrel, go ahead. Oh, that, um, that a lot of the traditional guidelines for, uh, for proper grammar, uh, I think, are uh, old wives' tales, and I think that they should not be treated as the Ten Commandments, as things that come down from some authority, but rather that we should di all dissect language see what works, see what doesn't, and change the standards uh, as, as necessary. Just to give you an example, the, the detested between you and I, or give Al Gore and I a chance. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? It, uh, presumably, uh, the president wouldn't say something like, give I a chance. So we can't exactly. really accuse him of being ignorant of the difference between I and me. No, you accuse him of having a bad ear, though. Well, here's what you can accuse him of. You, can, you might accuse him of taking uh, the advice of language guardians too seriously, because where that comes from is uh, every teenager has been corrected for saying things like, me and Jennifer are going to the mall. Mm -hmm. And what parents say is, no, 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 it's Jennifer and I are going to the mall. Mm -hmm. And people internalize that advice as, when in doubt, say, so-and-so and I instead of me and so-and-so. And that leads by uh, a 
kind of a hyper-correction, correcting yourself even when you weren't incorrect to begin with to forms like Between You and I or Give Owl and Gore, Gore and I a Chance. I think that comes from a kind of a ham-fisted rule, uh, avoid I as opposed to real insight as to how the English language works. And indeed, I think you can even uh, argue, I won't go into this uh, now because it requires some you know, fairly convoluted grammatical analysis, that uh, Give Al Gore and I a Chance, it's not clear that that's really ungrammatical in English. The tradition says it is. Uh, it's, uh, I think that's debatable. Uh, well, that's it's interesting because I, I don't think it's, it's debatable at all, and, 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 and it's certainly not uh, debatable uh, already. But I, thi I think your argument that uh, because uh, Bill Clinton might have been corrected as a child for that misformulation, he proceeds to misform it in all circumstances, with the, with the equivalent of saying to a child, cross the street when the green light is green. And now every time the light is green, he crosses the street. But that doesn't, that isn't logical, is it? But you still have to ask, why does a, uh, a former Rhodes Scholar, a, a highly verbal man, uh, among our recent presidents, he's certainly one of the most uh, articulate and voluble, yeah. uh, why is it that he would misremember such advice? Maybe it's that the advice isn't so good to begin with. And I, I, I argue in, in the language instinct that, in fact, there's nothing ungrammatical about either me and Jennifer are going to the store or give Al Gore and I a chance. Because when you stick two pronouns inside a conjunction, X and Y, it's a different grammatical construction than just using the pronoun by itself. Yeah, yeah well, but I, uh, and, and I criticize that, as John Simon did, as, as being sort of heuristic. You set up a set of rules and, uh, and the Menendez brothers go free. Uh, but but my, my rule here uh, is, is not alone grammatical, but um, a matter of sensibility. You, you wince and I wince and you wince when somebody says, I'll give it to Algo and I. Why do we wince? Because it doesn't sound natural to us. And uh, the, uh, uh, your, your leniency towards uh, abnormality in usage is, is what sort of distresses me about your thesis. I wouldn't say that. I, I'm not lenient uh, across the board. I think it just should be done, if you'll pardon the expression, scientifically mm -hmm. as opposed to religiously. I think that good writing is something that you do by uh, uh, practice, by exposure to other writers, by becoming a bit of a grammarian yourself and uh, dissecting your own sentences, not by having a set of laws that you follow and uh, for which you're a sinner if you disobey them. And uh, I think it's it, uh, that attitude that we need to get better language. After all, a lot of the worst examples of contemporary language, legalese, bureaucraties, oh, social, by highly educated people, yeah. social science, mumbo jumbo, they, it's perfectly grammatical. I mean, there are no split infinitives. It just takes a copy editor to turn uh, ungrammatical uh, language to grammatical language. It's awful for many other reasons, and it's really the larger problem of having an aesthetic for language, not following these uh, hoary rules that, that, uh, that we have to worry about. Things like simple sentences, uh, fresh metaphors, uh, avoiding cliches, uh, avoiding wordiness, avoiding obfuscation. 99% of what goes into good writing are old-fashioned guidelines like that, not worrying about split infinitives. Yeah, but I think you're wandering a, a little bit into the uh, artistic uh, 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 aspect. That is to say, if you, know, if, if, if you submit an essay uh, to the New Yorker, uh, it has to be something other than merely grammatical. There's got to be vivid metaphors and uh, uh, trenchant uh, uh, uses. It's got to be attractive. Uh, it draws people in. Now, what are the standards of the people who accept or deny a manuscript in the New Yorker? Uh, they, they, they are standards which uh, I would hope you would approve of, but uh, manifestly you don't if you think they should regard equally uh, something submitted to them with the kind of licentiousness that you accept and that I don't. If they were to, uh, if they were to get upset about hopefully about split infinitives, it would never be hopefully in the way you use it. Yeah, I think there are contexts in which that that would uh, make perfect sense. That's not uh, that's not licentiousness. That's just I, I think that is part of developing a good ear for the language is realizing which novel forms actually make it, make the language clearer, make it better, and not simply uh, trying to preserve something that that uh, that can't and in many cases shouldn't be preserved. Well, um, I, I think it's true that uh, some of the worst English, uh, never mind how grammatically done it is, is by our academics. 
uh, lawyers especially. Uh, I, I have read stuff by, I read a, I read a PhD thesis written for somebody at the University of Mexico, which I, I couldn't get through two or three paragraphs. I simply didn't understand what they're talking about. It was just can't. Uh, now, but that kind of stuff doesn't winnow through to those organs that accept responsibilities for usage. I mentioned the New Yorker as, as an example. Now, people reading your book might think that, among other things, you simply think of them as uh, imposters, i.e., they are exercising authority that they don't have any right to exercise. D it depends on what they do. Uh, I think if, they're, if they get upset about split infinitives, then yes, I think that they're... Uh, no, no, they wouldn't in the sense that I just yeah. quoted. There are people who know, who don't know, who care, who don't care, right. who don't care. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm perfectly ca ca capable of a, a splitting infinitive, but occasionally you run into a split infinitive, you say, why do they do that? Does it, it, it either does or does not draw uh, you when you read it. Then, then we agree. And in fact, a good editor, I think, uh, has a keen ear for innovations and violations sure. of, of old rules that are, are worth keeping. And in fact, it's often the, the pundits, the columnists, the commentators who take a much more rigid attitude than the editors who day to day have to deal with examples of the language or with enlightened dictionary writers like those of the uh, American Heritage Dictionary who time and time again uh, puncture all of these myths about what is improper and what is uh, proper. Well, uh, when you say they puncture it, uh, you mean they submit it to the usage panel and discover that in fact that which was thought illicit has become licit? Well, they don't just take a show of hands. I don't think it's majority rules. I mean, they have linguists on their board. Yeah, they, they make their own they judgment, make, but they, they, but they judgment, quote, yeah. yeah, but, but they, they, they quote, they, they give you the, sort of the vote of the usage panel. That's uh, right. Uh, they, so I think the, the idea is that uh, since you are going to be writing for other literate people, if you think to use a dictionary to begin with, you want to know what the expectations of your audience are. Mm -hmm. I mean, English isn't like uh, you know, Esperanto, a language that we rationally design. Uh, what is English depends on what is uh, common currency among the potential audience for your writing. And that's why I think you, it's good to consult a usage panel. Those are the kind of people who are going to be reading your prose. You want to know what they're going to be expecting. Well, well if, if you're the editor of a publishing a house and somebody comes in using very offbeat English, but uh, it sort of works, uh, I can understand your okaying that book, while at the same time, if you were the editor of a magazine, you would not okay it on the grounds that uh, the magazine might not be a place in which to make a statement about a new use of language, whereas a book would be uh, uh, a logical venue for it. Yes, a lot of it depends on context. Are you using uh, your own voice? Yeah. Are you s uh, si speaking in someone else's voice? Uh, have you found a, uh, a, a slang term that is widely known and more precise than any standard uh, alternative? I, I use words like to flame and, and to diss simply because there are no substitutes in standard English. Thank heavens that uh, those forms of slang came about. And in fact, uh, all innovations and in, all words have to come from somewhere. Someone has to be the first person to use a word. They, they weren't hand, handed down by a, uh, a committee. And that means that all words at some point must have been slang. And words like mob, bully, uh, sham, jazz, all were decried as horrible uh, uh, violence against the language when they were introduced. Now they're completely unexceptionable. So I don't think that one should use this week's slang, because chances are it will uh, it'll be embarrassing after a few weeks. But there are some forms of innovation that we should welcome, simply because they increase the range of ideas that we can express. Yeah, my, my point is that you should resist uh, the neo uh, uh, uh passion for long enough to test the question whether the word uh, is needed. Now, uh, uh, some, uh, I think it was Ronald Knox who said that uh, when the St. James Bible was written, they took uh, 17 ethical distinctions and combined them all into the single word righteous, setting back uh, ethical explorations by 2,000 years. Now, that, that was a, a capital crime. But at the, other, at the other end, you want to resist, don't you, words that are 
use because they're simply useful this afternoon uh, and uh, make a claim which uh, is not substantiated by their durability. Sure. If I was to say uh, it's been groovy rapping with you, yeah. then uh, I would be uh, embarrassing myself. <laughs> and so, you, uh, as in any uh, judged precise use of language, you have to develop an ear for what's likely to be durable and what is likely to be uh, yeah, Rapping is durable, but groovy hasn't yet proved out, I think. I think it's been a retreat from groovy. Well, it's used ironically. It's used uh, as a self-consciously corny way of speaking. Yeah. But, but, but you, you, you do agree that there should be that initial resistance. As you say to a, a new word or an, uh, an odd usage, you, you just prove to me that this is useful before I okay you in my next dictionary. Right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't impose some uh, uh, mandatory waiting period because some words just uh, spread so quickly and are so useful that they can be used right away. To flame is a wonderful example. I mean, there is just no substitute uh, for the word to flame in, in uh, uh, describing what some people do, and that the word is uh, in common currency is perhaps ten years old at ten most. Years old, yeah. Or surfing through the television channels is that's quite new, isn't it? Yes, right. Yeah, but that probably will endure. And it's a fresh enough metaphor that even if someone hasn't heard it, they can very quickly infer what it means. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Pinker. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next week on Firing Line, in part one of Regulating Cyber Smut, host Next William week on Firing Jr. Line, talks host with Kathleen William Buckley Jr. Jr. talks with New York Governor Michael George Kinsley, Pataki we about what John Perry Barlow, of the state's authority. Howard Glasser, Susan Estrich, and Esther Dyson about government regulation of the Internet. This program was a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Annenberg Foundation and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or call 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449.